All right, well, it's good to be back here. Uh, we are going to be continuing with our series, Upside Down Kingdom, speaking about uh, Jesus' uh, basically through his Sermon on the Mount, just to him talking about what those who live for the kingdom are like, those who are true followers of Christ. So we're going to be continuing with that. Why don't we, before we get into this message, uh, just have a word of prayer and ask God to speak to us and, and teach us through his word. God, we are so thankful that we can be here together as a family, God. And Lord, uh, we want to study your word. We want to, uh, Lord, get, gain insight from it. But, but God, just not, not from our heads. Lord, we want this to transform our lives. And so, Lord, as, as we teach this morning, Lord, as we've already been taught in a lot of us in Sunday school, I pray that you take your word and just apply it to our hearts by your spirit and that we might be obedient to it, Lord. We love you and we thank you that, Lord, we are not living for this kingdom, Lord, for here. We're living for your kingdom. And we pray that we'd focus in on that and that would change us. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open up to Matthew chapter 5. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we started a, about, about a month and a half ago by going through the Beatitudes. We spent some time there. Last week, we began this new series, Upside Down Kingdom, where we see the rest of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we started off with the beginning where Jesus talks about the natural implications of the Beatitudes. That if you live out the Beatitudes in your life, you will and you are salt and light to this dark world. Uh, and so we were challenged by that, okay? Um, we're challenged to not lose our saltiness, right? I, I hope you've been dwelling on this and, and meditating on this this week because it really changes the way you go about your life. Have you been salt this week? Have you been salt this week? Or have you lost your saltiness? See, salt was meant to preserve, okay? And someone came up to me after church and was like, you know what salt was also meant to do? It's meant to heal. And that is what we are as Christians in this world. We are salt. We, we preserve the morals, the, the, the values in society with God's word, with, with people living not for this world, but for the kingdom of God. And the way that it comes across, the way that other people become salt, that we can spread this salt, is we need to share the gospel, that transforming word of God, that our sins can be forgiven, that it's not all about our own righteousness. No, it's about God, his righteousness, his forgiveness. And so we were challenged to not lose our saltiness. We were also challenged to shine our light, not to cover up that light that we have as Christians. And basically what I, what I really got from that myself personally was in studying it, when we were told that we are salt and we are light, it's not that we have to try and be this way. It's just as Christians, if you're living for the kingdom, that is what you are. That is who you are. You are salt and you are light. And because of that, you will stand out. You don't have to fear standing out. It's what you should be in a good way. So kingdom people, we started off saying they are salt and they are light. And as I was uh, planning the sermon series out, I, uh, I was not going to spend much time in verses 17 through, oh, I don't know what they are, 20, 17 through 21. But I want to spend a little time there I gave you an article to read on our Facebook page. I, I hope you took, took time to check it out. I wanted to just talk about this, uh, these, these intermediate verses where Jesus focuses in on the law and the prophets because they are really foundational to what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is saying. And then we're going to talk about overcoming anger. So why don't we just start Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. That's where we'll begin our time. Um, my, my series is titled Overcoming Anger, and we'll get to that, but this really leads right into it. So, so follow me with this. We'll start off with verse 17, and uh, I encourage you to open up your Bibles, even though it's on the screen sometimes. Read it in your Bibles. Underline those things that stand out. That way you can take it home. It says this, Do not think, this is Jesus speaking, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law 
until all is accomplished. So as these verses flow from salt and light, Jesus has to clarify something. Uh, These verses are an explanation of why Jesus came to the earth. He begins by saying, do not think. Do not think. Okay, and what Jesus was about to say, he needed to clarify a misunderstanding that was going to naturally come up from what he was saying. He had not come to abolish the Old Testament. No, he'd not come to do that. He'd not come to, to take it away, to leave it, leave it behind. No, he had come, as he said, to fulfill them. To fulfill them. And if you study the word fulfill, in the Greek language, it, it occurs a number of times in Matthew, and there, there you see how it is to be used in what Jesus was saying. Normally means, take this, take this to note, to bring to its intended meaning. I have come to fulfill them, okay? Not to end them, but to bring them, to to color them in, to fill out those empty spaces. Uh, Fulfill doesn't mean to bring to an end. That's not what he meant there. Rather, it means to fill out, to expand, and to complete. And so with this in mind, the primary purpose of the Old Testament, what Jesus was saying was it was pointing to someone, and that was him. And he was coming to bring it to fulfillment. Now, I have a daughter. I don't know, is Zoe in here? Does she go to children's church? She loves to color. Who likes to color in here? Yeah, all the kids go, okay, we got some adults too, okay. You know, when you color, what do you have in front of you? You basically have like a a black and white sketch, right? And your job is to take all those crayons, or if if you're an adult, I took all the markers away from our kids because they were getting all over the walls, okay. (laughs) <laughs> so he'd take her crayons and, and she'd just color in all those all those blank spaces with color and come up with some pretty cool cool uh, coloring pages at the end. She loves to color, okay? Think of that as the Old Testament because this is how you're really going to get what Jesus was saying, that, that he came to fulfill them. Think of the Old Testament like a blank coloring page, just, just a pencil sketch. Guess what Jesus came to do? He came to color it in. He came to fill it in with color so that people would really truly see what it really meant. He came to fulfill it. That is Jesus. He was the true portrait. And so, if you read through the Old Testament, you have to read through it recognizing that this was a blank sketch. (laughs) Beginning from Genesis, ending in Malachi. Okay, If you read through it, remember... See it through the lens of Christ, through the lens of the Messiah coming. That is who is going to come to fulfill it. That's what Jesus meant. Okay? The Old Testament, he's saying, is not going away. It's not going away. It's coming to fruition in me. And so he continues then to speak about the law and its requirements. He says this, verse 19. Therefore... Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do, do, do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, the religious people that he was talking about, maybe they weren't too unlike you and me. They were caught up in following the letter of the law trying to look good on the outside, trying to just obey what the Bible said, okay? They had the Torah. They had the law from Moses, and it was very precise. They had, had to offer sacrifices. They had to, to take care of things God's way, and they were so caught up in following the law to the T that they missed out on the intent, the spirit behind it. And that was their problem. And so Jesus, as the king of the kingdom, he was saying, look, it's not the letter of the law that I'm looking for. It's the heart. It's the heart. I want you not to just obey the letter of the law. I want you to think of God and his heart behind giving it to you, the spirit of the law. That is where it extends to. And he's saying that those who teach it and those who obey it will be blessed in the kingdom. 
Well, he really fleshes this out and clears up all the, all the mess that you might be thinking, huh, what? No, what's going on? This is the key verse to the Sermon on the Mount. And if there's nothing that you take, if the one thing that you take away, this is the verse, I want you to just take it home and memorize it. Put it on your mirror because it changes your Christian life. If you have not understood this already, it says this, Jesus continues on, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Of heaven. Now you're thinking, what? I can't go to heaven. I'm not a scribe. I'm not a Pharisee. I can't be as righteous as those holy men of God. That's not me. Was that what Jesus' point was? Was he saying you've got to beat the scribes and the Pharisees at their own game? No, he was not. No. See, these scribes and these Pharisees, they were like the clergy. They were the professional do-gooders. I recognize these scribes, they fasted, they prayed, they tithed, they live according, lived according to the rules. They were pretty, pretty good at obeying the law, uh, obeying all the external requirements of the law. But they didn't meet that punchline that Jesus was getting to. If you want to see the punchline, you just got to got to maybe flip a page or or glance down to 5 verse 40, 48. He fleshes this out completely, explaining what he meant by righteousness. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This statement taking the logical conclusions of 5 verse 20. God requires perfection. He does. Not relative perfection, that based on a sliding scale. I I used to be in in college, we we took um, philosophy with this guy that was just like a brainiac, and no one understood what he says, and so the whole class was failing. They had like a 40% average, you know, with tests. But he graded on the scale compared to everyone else, and so we all ended up with like a 70% grade at the end of the class. That's not how God grades us or judges us. He doesn't grade us compared to someone else. That's not how he does it. He says the perfect standard is me. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. If you cannot be that, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry. The standard is God himself. And this is where He got the scribes and the Pharisees. See, they were good at their external. They were good at at living according to the law. I even met a a, a devout Jewish Jewish rabbi when I was over in Guatemala, and he said that he 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 was he was pretty much there. Like he had done it. Like he was perfect. Yet where Jesus got these guys was he said, No, look inside. Look at your motives. Look at your thoughts. Look at your attitudes. This is where you fail. You may look good and all put together like you have obeyed the letter of the law, but you have disobeyed the spirit of the law. They thought that religious performance was what God wanted, but that's not what he wanted. Jesus says that when we stand before God, we've got to do better than that. And so again, Jesus was not talking about beating the scribes and the Pharisees at their own game. No, he was talking about a different kind of righteousness altogether. That from Christ. And so the reason I told you, take that verse home. That verse from Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. That unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Take it home and memorize it because that should drive you to your knees in thanks to God if you've received Christ because it is his righteousness that has been applied to your account if you have indeed repented of your sins and trusted in him alone, his righteousness alone, not your own righteousness for your salvation. That is how you enter into the kingdom of heaven. And it is the key verse of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, as we move on from here, what Jesus does is he makes six comparisons. 
you can see them uh, maybe titled in, in the headlines of Matthew chapter 5 uh, and, and continuing on from there. He makes six comparisons. He starts to talk about anger, about lust, about divorce, oaths, loving your enemies, giving to the needy. And he uses these statements and says, You have heard it said, but I say to you, taking what we know from the law, what they knew, what they had understood, tried to follow, were religiously devout to, obeying the letter of. And he was saying, look, here's the earthly standard. Here is God's standard. But I say to you. And so he talks through each of these things, making it very clear that it's not the external that God is looking for. No, it is the internal, the heart that God wants. And that is what living for the kingdom is all about. Remember, Jesus, his whole theme here is, is talking about what kingdom people look like. Upside down. And so we are going to continue with verse 21. With this as a background. Where it says this. You have heard it said to those of old. You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Okay, so this is the first you have heard it said. You have heard it said. You know the letter of the law. You've probably memorized this already. The Old Testament said that if you murder, you are liable to judgment. According to the rabbis, what they taught and they practiced was that if you murder, you receive the death penalty. Jesus goes on. Verse 22. The beginning of it. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. If you have your notes with you, his first point is here. Unresolved anger is sin. Now, we thought that just murder was sin. They, they might have said to, said to Jesus, that's what the law says, murder is sin. But you're saying now that even anger, anger in our hearts, unresolved anger between our brothers, that that is also liable to judgment? That's his point. He's moving from the earthly standard to the heavenly standard. Anger, even if it is kept inside, internal, in the heart, is also sin. And it also brings God's judgment. Now, there are some misunderstandings that come with this verse. First one is this. Is murder equal to anger? <laughs> no, it is not. It is not. It, there are two different acts, okay? It's not saying that Murder is the same thing as being angry with someone. I would much rather that you were angry with me than that you would come to my home and murder me, okay? Please. <laughs> but it's just for the record, that's what it's saying, okay? Murder is not the same thing as anger, but they are equal in that they are sin. Second, misunderstanding is it is not saying that all anger is sin okay don't we know that from other passages in scripture uh, that says in your anger do not sin i think what what jesus was expressing here was was that anger is a, is a very volatile place that you can be okay because it's a reaction often to what is happening to you personally. If you are getting angry, you need to guard yourself because it leads to a whole host of sins. And maybe even that initial response of anger welling up in you, that could be sinful in itself as well. If it's not, if it's done out of selfishness and for unrighteous motives, which it often is, most often. So be careful. Guard yourself against this. Unresolved anger is sin. But not all anger is. And we'll get that clear. There's a few other verses that speak to this. Um, and, and we'll continue with, with the rest of Matthew 22 before we, before we go into those verses that speak in the Bible about anger. Let's continue on with the rest of verse 22. Again, it says, Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger 
of the fire of hell. Now, you may have different words there when it says raka or you fool. It may say something else in your translations. That's okay, because what they were doing is they're just trying to convey the meaning of that word over, okay? As I've looked up these, the meanings of these words, you may have something slightly different, and that's, that's just part of Bible interpretation. Raka means empty head, okay? <laughs> what would you be saying if someone was an empty head, the airhead? What are you thinking? You, you were, what are you doing? Okay, that is an insult. Fool, it's a Greek word for moron, okay? These are not nice words to say, and, and that is what we naturally do when we're angry. Words fly out of our mouth, we don't think about what we're saying, and we end up hurting people and destroying people that are made in the image of God. And that, was, that is what he was saying. Just like murder, those nasty words that we say when we are angry, they are both deserving of hell. And if Jesus hadn't paid for your sins, if it wasn't his righteousness that was applied to your account, that is what you would deserve. God takes seriously anger. Why? Because in our anger, we lose sight of a person that God loves. Now, I want you to look at this chart here. Oh, where to go? Could you bring it back there to the chart? I, I somehow lost it there. There's a chart that I want you to see. It, it, it begins with, you have heard. There it is. Maybe it's a little small. But it just makes this comparison of, of what Jesus is saying and why he is saying it. It's, it starts off where, where Jesus says, you have heard. He's talking about the law. Okay? And then it goes on. He says, anyone who murders is liable to judgment. Okay? This is the earthly standard. This is the death penalty the, on the earthly kingdom. Okay? But he says, but I tell you, kingdom, God's kingdom, anyone who is angry is subject to judgment from the heart. Now, maybe somebody doesn't see it from, from the outside, but God sees it from the inside and is deserving of sin. In the heavenly kingdom, this is the spirit behind the law. He says again, law, anyone who says, Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin, the earthly government. But anyone who says fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Moving from the earthly standard to the kingdom standard. I hope you see those comparisons. Before we move on, we also want to just quickly examine the rest of the New Testament and what it says about anger. In 2 Corinthians 12, Verse 20, this is uh, speaking to the church in Corinth. He says, for I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. For I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, fractions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. This is not how God wants his church to act. And you notice that he points out anger, <laughs> probably being the motive behind all of these things that were going on in the church. Unresolved anger, destructive, and needs to be worked out. We also see in Ephesians 4, 26, 27, it says, In your anger, we've referenced this verse already, do not sin. There is a type of righteous anger. We saw that Jesus actually himself got angry in a righteous way says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Reconcile. And do not give the devil a foothold. In our anger, when we react in our anger and let it control us, we are giving the devil a place. Even in our lives as Christians, yes, he can. Even, the, even when the Spirit of God dwells in you, Satan can attack you, and you can fall under his attacks. So guard yourself against it. Ephesians 4 verse 31 there's another encouragement to the church saying, get rid of all bitterness, 
rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Colossians 3 verse 8, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. And lastly, in James 1 verses 19 and 20, my dear brothers, Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. If you are living for the kingdom, our natural response is to forgive, to resolve our issues of anger. Does it say that that will be easy? No, it doesn't. But it definitely lays out that this is so important, especially within the church, especially for those that say they're living for the kingdom. So unresolved anger, we see the first point, it is sin. Secondly, we see that reconciliation is important. In verse 23, it goes on to say, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now this verse shows the importance of reconciliation. Jesus says that it is important enough that you are to stop and leave worship over it. You are to interrupt worshiping God to work out your issues of anger. Now, there's a question that comes up within this verse. And if you don't read the rest of Scripture, you'll be imbalanced in, in your view of how you deal with anger. It's the question of who takes the initiative when there is unresolved anger? Who takes it? Well, this verse is the one that perceived that they may have sinned against someone else, that their brother is angry at them for something that they did. They're to take the initiative, okay? Now, they're probably not angry. They're probably not upset, but they've come to realize that someone is upset with them. And so scripture is saying, if you know that someone has something that is held against you, leave, go, and reconcile. Go deal with it. Go and apologize to them. Ask for their forgiveness. Own whatever you did. Humble yourself. So is the standard always that the party that offended should be the first one to go, according to Scripture? No. It's not just the offending party. It's also the offended party that is also to go. If you read the book of Matthew uh, chapter 18, it also lays out that it's not just the responsibility of the offending party, to go and reconcile, to take initiative. No, it's also the responsibility of the party that's offended and probably angry to go to the offender and reconcile. It says this, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault between the two of you, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, Take one or two others along. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. There it lays out. Conflict Resolution 101. This is how it is to be done. And too often, we see two parties that will refuse to go to one another. What does scripture say? If you know something is wrong, whether you have offended someone or if you have been offended and you are angry, it is your responsibility no matter what side you are on, to go and work things out. Even if it means owning just 1% of something that happened, and they have 99% of the wrong, you got to go and reconcile. Stop living on two sides, different sides of the church. That is God's standard for the kingdom. So repent, uh, reconciliation is important, we see. Let's move on from here. This last section, we see a mini parable from Jesus. 
as he teaches us that the business of reconciliation is not just important, repentance is urgent. And this parable that Jesus shares can, could be a little confusing, and we're going to try to just simplify it and break it down as to just referring to talking about anger and how it can imprison us. Let's read here in verse 25. It says this, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, when we look at this, we see an earthly example that Jesus uses. Okay? We see someone that has borrowed money uh, from a creditor, and he's defaulted on his payment. Uh, this, this man then takes him to court, and in Scripture is saying, Come to terms quickly with him, lest you be handed over to the judge, who's going to hand you over to, to the, the uh, guard, and you be put into prison, because you failed to pay your debts. You failed to pay that financial debt that you owed. Well, guess what? There's a whole lot more behind this story that we could go into. We're going to just try and keep it simple. We could analyze every single detail. First thing I wanted to focus on was, was the first thing that Jesus said, come to terms quickly. Come to terms quickly. That lays out repentance is urgent. Reconcile right away, okay? It says, says you know, if something's going on, settle outside of, of court before it, it escalates into something that, that you're going to be imprisoned by. I believe that as he's talked about anger, that this natural flow of thought throws, flows into this parable as well. Because when we are angry with someone, we ought to come to terms quickly with them before our anger imprisons us. That is what happens with anger, okay? You know what it's like to be frustrated with somebody. Doesn't it consume your thoughts? Doesn't it keep you from sleep? Often that is the greatest cause for lack of sleep that I have had in my life when I know that I have something is wrong between someone else. I know that I have to do something, and I've refused to do it. I can't sleep. And you become imprisoned by your anger, and it only gets worse. It only escalates. He says, come to terms quickly. Come to terms quickly with your accuser. Resolve it immediately before it can escalate. It goes on, it goes on to then talk about the accuser. Now, I would compare that accuser to our enemy of anger. That accuser is an enemy. Anger is our enemy, and it has power to imprison us. And that prison is it's not just a physical prison, okay? Often it's an emotional prison and a spiritual prison for us. That anger is. And Jesus uses that word at the end, assuredly or truly, Truly, I say, illustrating the point that until we pay that debt of love that we owe to our neighbor, that debt of love that we've received from Christ himself, until we go as Christ has reconciled us to himself, we ought to reconcile ourselves to one another. Until we pay that debt, we will be imprisoned by it. We are debtors of his love. I think that's the point there. If you carry on that natural flow from anger, we've got to resist anger and love one another as Christ has done that for us. Romans 13, verse 8, I don't have it on the screen, but it says this, Let no debt remain outstanding except the debt, except the continuing debt to love one another. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. You know how you love your brothers and sisters, your co-workers, your friends, your enemies? Reconcile with them. Come to terms quickly with ways that you're being annoyed, or you're angered. Work them out because you will be imprisoned by those things if you do not. So as we close, let me just ask you this. By way of application, and uh, 
a way to just, just break it down in our lives is three questions. What unresolved anger are you holding on to today that you need to go and reconcile and resolve with someone else and with God? What unresolved anger are you holding on to this morning? What anger do you need to repent of? And third, who do you need to reconcile with? Pray that as we recognize as kingdom people, it's not about us. It's about God. It's about his kingdom. I think oftentimes what, what keeps us from reconciling is we, we just don't want to humble ourselves down to that level. And we don't want to be embarrassed by having to come, to come to terms with someone that we don't particularly like. But scripture teaches us that if we are living for the kingdom, that we will resolve our issues of anger. And that will be an example to others in this world as salt and light. And so what unresolved anger are you holding on to this morning? Who do you need to reconcile with? Maybe you don't know God. Maybe you're here as, as an unbeliever saying, I, I, don't even, I don't even believe this stuff. Guess what? Jesus, in this whole process, did this for us himself first. He is our perfect example. It says in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that verse. But what it means is, Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the glorious truth is that the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were the offending party, the offended party came to us and reconciled with us. He did that work. He didn't have to. And so he is our perfect example. As we read 2 Corinthians, closing, this, closing, closing our time together, let this speak truth into your heart and motivate you. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you catch that? He reconciled us to himself. Therefore, now we have the ministry of of reconciliation. We ought to be the first one when there are issues of anger, tension in our workplace, in our homes, in our families, we ought to be the one that are going and reconciling, even though we may be the one offended. Let's practice that and let's live as people of the kingdom. And if you're not part of the kingdom, repent of your sins, trust in Jesus, accept his reconciliation for us on the cross his righteousness. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful, Lord, that we've been challenged again by your word. Lord, to live for your kingdom and not our own. Lord, too many times the reason why we don't practice this is because of our own feeling of, of pride and, and wanting to look good on the outside. God, you say you want the heart. Lord, those exterior things don't matter as much as us following you following the spirit of the law. And so, God, we are grateful for your righteousness that you have freely given to us as a gift. God, and that you've reconciled us through your death on the cross to the Father. Lord, you paid the debt of sin that we owe. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be those that, as we've been told, have that ministry of reconciliation. God, help us to be that as the church to be salt and light in that way, God. We love you, and we pray that as we continue, you would keep on teaching us and, and changing us, transforming us for your kingdom, God. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we close our time, uh, we're just going to wrap up our service by announcements. We don't have a pianist right now, so <laughs> we're not going to close with a song, but I'll invite Wayne up. He's going to uh, close our service with some announcements. So thank you, Wayne. Okay, very good. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a few quick, make sure you read your bulletin, folks, uh, upcoming events. Uh, and you saw the promo for th this Matthew Moore coming up next Sunday. Uh, he's a pretty dynamic speaker, as you can well see, and it's going to be great. So invite a lot of folks in from the community and, and uh, come and enjoy uh, the 
as Matthew talks about the life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, right after church, Women's Missionary Fellowship, they're having a meeting next Sunday right after church. Kids for Truth is having a meeting. Uh, so make sure you make plans to attend those things. And uh, let's see. Now I think that's about all the announcements we have. So uh, let's uh, close in prayer. God, thank you so much for this time we have had to learn from your word how we are to conduct our lives, God, because of Jesus Christ, because of the righteousness he imparted to us, the, we imperfect people, God, but you have made us possible for us to be perfect to our Father because of Jesus. Father, thank you for that. Help us this week, God, to live our lives accordingly. Father, thank you that we can. I give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Dismissed.